Today, we talk about climate and energy. It's um, a topic that is extremely relevant, as you know, as energy production, as we will see, is uh, uh, a major source uh, of uh, greenhouse gases emissions uh, by humans. The topic is uh, becoming more and more relevant uh, with the recent uh, developments uh, in terms of international relationship between countries, as you know very well. In fact, uh, uh, starting from uh, uh, a little bit more than one year ago from the onset of the war in Ukraine, uh, of the war between Ukraine and Russia, there has been uh, some changes in uh, the energy systems uh, at the international level. Because as we will see energy systems, energy, uh, or let's say systems for energy production and energy use are becoming more and more interconnected with respect to the past uh, where, uh, when uh, there was uh, more independence uh, by each country in the energy production. And then progressively, we connected the systems in order to make them more resilient. This was done uh, for, uh, in consideration of the increasing importance of energy for societal development. So resilience of the energy systems. So their reliability in order to avoid uh, uh, to avoid blackouts, uh, for instance, or in any case, uh, uh, decreases, uh, shortages of energy. So the awareness of the important role of energy uh, mm, stimulated international efforts in order to connect the systems, in order to structure them in a way that allows for a reciprocal support through connection. And uh, in this way, this international interconnection made the energy systems more complex in their organization, which means also their management, their, 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 their let's say, flexibility is a little bit, let's say, became more complicated, more complex. And therefore, uh, after uh, the onset uh, of the international tensions in Europe, uh, the energy system has, has had to be adapted to the new situation. What I am lecturing today is a mix uh, of uh, information that preceded this change uh, and some updates. It's not easy to provide uh, timely updates uh, as uh, the situation is continuously evolving. And therefore, uh, uh, the the, da the data, the information is continuously changing, but I made an effort to try to include some uh, new information, new data in, uh, in what I'm presenting to you today. Let me click on the link. Uh, this is the uh, web page of this lecture, which is organized in the usual way. Let me open the PowerPoint that is at the end, uh, which uh, I use, as you know, to for lecturing. There is a part in this PowerPoint that is uh, the final part, which is not yet included in, uh, in the web page, but I will make the update of the web page soon. Okay, just one second. I don't, okay, here it is. Good. Okay. So, climate and energy. Actually, we should say some more in the title, like climate, water, uh, and energy, food production. There are several components, several systems in our societal organization that are related to energy and therefore related directly to climate. So when we make uh, policies related to energy production, we have an effect on climate, but we have also implications on food production, 
water resources management for the important role of uh, hydroelectricity in energy production and uh, for uh, the important role played by these connections between water, food, society, energy, and climate. These are connections uh, that uh, we are just starting to learn. These are connections that are articulated through international networks, uh, as I said, international networks that are continuously evolving and uh, the mechanisms regulating uh, these connections are um, not fully perceived, not fully known because uh, there are several random components uh, which need to be interpreted in a statistical way through, for instance, the influence of the market, uh, the influence of the international investments uh, and the influence uh, of, uh, of uh, political mechanisms. So it is uh, a, an extremely exciting topic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's a topic that is continuously evolving. There is the need for continuously updating our information. And what I said in my premise is uh, a further demonstration of the need of continuously updating the information. So during the past couple of weeks, uh, I made an effort to try to update what I'm saying. Um, and uh, the perspective that I am providing today is, of course, limited. It's uh, only, uh, um, only a small detail into the big picture of uh, international connections, international, uh, international trading for energy, international energy system. Just one second, because uh, this message, it's not relevant. Okay, now. First of all, uh, let me provide uh, uh, an introduction of, on energy. What is energy? It is, uh, it is something that we all know. When I talk about energy, everybody of you understands what I'm talking about. But uh, as uh, Vincenzo Balzani said, who is an emeritus professor at the University of Bologna, of Bologna and a very famous scientist, he was uh, a candidate to the Nobel Prize and got very close to it. So as he says, if you want to embarrass somebody, you could just ask what is energy? Because uh, it's difficult to explain in words. It's something, as I said, that we all know, but what is the definition? So uh, we know that uh, energy is needed. We know that energy is strictly related to our welfare, to the industrial development, to transportation, to heating uh, houses, uh, to several things, but what is the definition of energy? It's important that uh, we have it clear because many people make confusion between energy, electrical energy, chemical energy, or uh, other terms uh, for which uh, there is a general understanding of what they mean, but it's not fully clear. So uh, in physics, uh, Energy is defined as the quantitative property that must be transferred to a body or physical system to perform work on the body or to heat it. So again, in physics, energy is a quantitative property that must be transferred to a body or a physical system to perform work or to heat the body. So, Simply put, energy is the ability to do work. We need energy for doing work. I'm not going into the details of the definition, the units, etc. But we have to have it clear what is energy. So in order to produce work, we need energy, which can be available in different forms. It is measured in joule, as you can see here, but let's forget about it for now. It's, it's not really needed that we go into the technical details here. We, we don't need to know uh, what is, uh, how mechanisms for energy production are structured or how network for energy sharing, energy distribution are structured. Okay, so, um, then we need energy in order to produce work. And energy is considered a primary resource. 
uh, for ensuring human well-being. We know that. And uh, when we get a blackout, we realize how much energy is important. I just want to, to stress also that in modern times, uh, with the increasing importance of digitalization, of uh, electronic systems, of, uh, uh, um, of uh, IT, information technology, energy is becoming more and more important. In a way, in our societal development, we are becoming more and more dependent on energy. It was necessary also in the past, but in our societal development is uh, becoming energy more and more important. Actually, the same can be said for other primary resources like uh, water and food. I mean, water is becoming more and more important. Why? Because our water demands are increasing, not only because we need more water for our personal use, but because we need water for energy production, by the way, because uh, some plants for energy production needs to be cooled and uh, we cool them by using water. Uh, we need uh, uh, also water for uh, hydroelectric energy production and uh, uh, also food is becoming more and more important because uh, with the increase of human population and with the increase of welfare, we need more food than in the past. So in a way, our society by evolving becomes more, uh, becomes less resilient to uh, the lack of primary resources like energy, water, and food. And uh, let me also say that in our evolution, our society becomes uh, less resilient against climate change. This is something that we cannot avoid. If we want to make a more organized use of resources in order to increase the welfare, necessarily we become, we become more dependent on these resources. The only way for limiting our impact on nature, on the earth system is to go, to go back to the prehistory or when the societal development was uh, close to zero. So it is something that we cannot avoid. It is something that it is anyway positive, but on the other end, we need to become more and more efficient, more and more smart uh, in, the, in the use of natural resources and primary resources like energy. So what is the source of the energy in the Earth system? It's only sun. So energy reaches the earth system through sun. And uh, you, this may seem like strange to you because you may think for instance of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are a primary source of energy. As we will see, they are still playing a very relevant role and fossil fuels you may think that are not related to sun. Actually, they are related to sun. Fossil fuels were originated by sun. Fossil fuels are a storage of energy from the sun that reached the earth system in the past, and then was accumulated, transformed into biomass, natural gas, and oil. So when we burn oil, we burn energy that was stored by the earth system in the past coming from the sun. So again, sun is the only source of energy. Suns moves the water cycle as we learn it, and therefore moves water over the mountains, pump, pumps back water from the oceans to the mountains. And in doing that, it gives more energy to water. And then we use the energy of water for producing hydroelectricity. In saying that, it's clear that it's not eternal. Sun is not eternal. Life on the earth will not be eternal. And the flux of energy to the earth, to the universe will not be eternal. Or let's say, I don't want to anticipate a, a more complicated reasoning that you will make in a few slides. So 
the energy coming from the sun is not eternal, okay? And, uh, but uh, on the other end, of course, we assume that in the time scale that is uh, interesting for us, uh, the energy from the sun is constant, is not decreasing, is not changing significantly. And therefore the big question is how to manage this energy that comes from the sun, how to convert it in forms that we can use for our purposes. Because as you know, if I want to, to turn the light on, I cannot use directly the energy from the sun. I need to convert it. So photovoltaic panels may be a means to store, to generate electricity, which is then used to turn the light on, okay? So, as I said, then we can say that this energy from the sun may come directly, such in the form of radiation and photosynthesis, or indirectly, in the form of uh, moving water, in the form of fossil fuels and other forms. Okay, so the sun is our source of energy. And uh, so you may think, uh, I think we need to give a demonstration to provide some data on the importance of energy. And uh, energy is uh, largely produced by, by burning fossil fuels. So in giving these numbers, I will refer to uh, to uh, oil needed for producing some basic goods that we need in, uh, in the form of food or other forms. So we may say that the production of uh, one kilogram of meat on average requires seven liters of oil. It is uh, demanding, it's really demanding because you need energy in order to produce this meat through the whole chain of the production process uh, from farming uh, to, uh, to uh, working over the meat to make it usable for our purposes, etc. With three liters of oil, we may desalinate uh, 1000 liters of seawater, which uh, gives to you an idea of how much energy is required to desalinate water. Think that you are using for your personal purposes, uh, something like not less than 50 liters of water per day. So when you take a shower, think uh, at the oil that uh, was burned in order to make this uh, water available. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, not all the water that you use is derived from desalination, I would say, uh, in Italy, it's, it's, uh, desalination is, is negligible. On the other hand, uh, uh, whatever method is used to make uh, water resources available, think of, uh, of the CO2 emissions that were needed in order to make this water ready to use at the top. Producing a ton of aluminum requires about, about five tons of oil. Producing a car requires about three tons of oil, which is about 25% of the energy consumed by a car in its lifetime. So these are numbers that are really impressive in my opinion. And energy production accounts for about 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions that is mainly obtained by burning fossil fuels as we will see in detail and therefore the impact on climate change is clear. So the topic is uh, indeed, uh, the issue is indeed topical and uh, it requires, uh, as you know, a careful attention. This is why energy production is uh, today on the agenda of the international relationships. Now, um, some uh, uh, consideration on the international situation are reported here, and uh, um, I already made a premise on that. I think that uh, in the last 12 months, we became more and more aware of the important role of energy. What is the implication of increasing costs for energy production? These are very important implications. And keep in mind that we are in a context that is uh, quite resilient. 
and unfortunately these uh, problems of uh, uh, management of primary resources food energy and uh, water these problems are impacting more the uh, more exposed categories of population the more exposed countries we are in italy we are suffering from the increased costs of energy but not as much as in other countries where they have systems that are less resilient so what we realized in the last year was not actually the worst that could happen uh, that happened in other countries we were told that th during the last winter probably we would not be able of uh, heating our houses this didn't happen we spent more but at the end uh, we were able to to heat our houses but in some countries indeed they suffered from this they suffered from this problem they had already limited energy resources and after this complication of the international relationship, uh, there is uh, they their situation became became uh, worse than in the let's say than more than twelve months ago. This is why uh, the the complexity of the problem brought uh, caused an increase of our attention to energy transition. Energy transition now is a very popular term. More than one year ago. What is energy transition? Energy transition is uh, a transformation in an energy system which requires a structural change of it. So not just a management change, but also a structural change in both energy supply and consumption. And you understand that this transition, if it requires a structural change, is not easy. And it, it implies a broad shift in technologies. It implies uh, uh, broad shift in vision and international relations. As I said, and you can see, you can see here um, later, I, I'm mentioning it in the next slide. As I said, energy systems are now interconnected and therefore that any transition requires an international, international cooperation, requires international agreements. Today, the term energy transition is mainly used to mean a transition towards production systems that are less impacting on climate. But actually, we had already other transition in energy systems in the past. So it's, it's not the first time that we need a transition, an energy transition, a change in energy systems. For instance, after the Industrial Revolution, there was a big change in energy systems because uh, uh, they started to use coal and later natural gas in order to make energy. While before then that, they used mainly uh, biomass, like the use of uh, woody material to produce energy. And after the Industrial Revolution, they uh, transitioned to the usage of coal and oil and natural gas later on. So it's not the first time, but today we mean with the energy transition, an uh, international effort to shift towards energy production systems that are less impacting on climate. So this term is in strict relationship with climate change. How to uh, how can we how can we um, promote energy transition? First of all, there is a relevant question that is timing. Transitions require time. The term transition suggests that we need time. And of course, we need time because we need to make structural changes. We need to make international agreement. We need to make changes also in the habit of population. And, you know, habit of population, we know that to change it, we require at least one generation in order to promote a major shift in, the, in, in our uh, uh, day to day behavior in our day to day use of resources, unless uh, we get a shock. If we get a shock, 
the history tells us that if we get a shock, then we can change our, our habit in a very short time. But the shock has implications. The shock is, causes an impact for other reasons. A relevant example is, has been the pandemic. The pandemic changed in a, in a time window of a few hours completely our habit, our day-to-day -day, our day-to-day -day organization and reduced in a few hours our CO2 emissions a lot. Not really the amount that we can think of because we continue to produce energy, we continue to produce food, but still it was a big change that occurred in a few hours, but it was the result of a shock. And uh, these shock are, uh, are not really uh, what we hope for, because uh, as I said, they have implications. We uh, wish a smooth transition, but a smooth tra transition requires time. On the other end, if we look at the timing of energy transition, we realize that it may be incompatible with uh, the timing of climate change because climate change would require a urgent action which uh, uh, cannot wait for uh, one generation. We are continuously told that we don't have that amount of time in order to take actions against climate change. On the other hand, it's clear that uh, also accelerating a transition beyond a certain limit may be in itself the cause of a shock and may also increase the disparity, the inequity with respect to different countries, different people. So it is a big question mark. There is not a ready to use solution. On the one hand, if we want to minimize the impact, the negative implication of this uh, energy transition, we need time. On the other hand, climate cannot wait long. And uh, of course, there is some uncertainty in the definition of these time scales. And therefore, what we require is an improved knowledge, an improved knowledge and improved the scientific basis. We require uh, an improvement of awareness. And awareness means that everybody should do something, not just expecting that other, uh, other do something, which is something difficult to reach. And uh, it is also required an international cooperation to a certain extent. And of course, uh, uh, international cooperation doesn't mean that uh, we have to converge to a unique country, a unique government. This is uh, not needed. And probably it's also not possible. And probably it wouldn't be the best way to make uh, an optimal use of uh, Earth's resources. But on the other hand, we need uh, an international cooperation that uh, guarantees equity and uh, uh, equality of opportunities, which is not easy. And this is why we are now studying uh, how to produce energy and how we can support the energy transition. This picture, which is uh, not readable here on the screen, it is quite nice. It is available, uh, a high resolution version is available from my website under the web page of this lecture. There is a link for a high resolution that makes it readable. This picture, I think it is nice because it clarifies, it, it puts together an overall prediction of how energy production and use will change in the next, uh, let's say uh, it is extended to 2050. This is just the result of a prediction. So you don't have to take these numbers as granted for sure. So. I, I, here you see that um, they predict uh, um, by 2050 about uh, uh, reaching about a percentage of 50% of uh, energy produced by using non-fossil fuels. 
Now, this percentage is about 19%. Renewable today, as we will see in more detail with the next slides, accounts for about 19% of global energy production. It increased a lot. 10 years ago, it was about 11, 12%. But, uh, you know, the target of getting to 50% by 2050 is, uh, is, is uh, a target that is, uh, is a challenge and still is not meeting the requirement of making uh, uh, the, the world carbon neutral by 2050. And I think it is a nice picture because um, it provides a nice visualization. The only thing is that uh, reading it is uh, the font probably should be increased a little bit, but it is um, provides to you a nice overview of the transition timeline and its incompatibility with uh, the targets uh, suggested by the Paris Agreement that for 2050 uh, suggests uh, uh, more neutrality with respect to what this picture is presenting. But still it's interesting to see this uh, perspective, subjective if you want, but on the other end, illuminating. So in order to understand, as I said, how the transition may take place, it's necessary that we learn more about energy. We learned the definition, probably you already knew it. Now let's uh, learn some more on how energy is today produced and how energy is today used. First of all, there are six forms of energy as uh, the some of you know, because some of you are studying uh, energy production, are studying uh, uh, energetic engineering or, or, uh, or uh, very uh, close fields. So there are six forms of energy, thermal, chemical, electrical, electromagnetic, kinetic, and nuclear. So kinetic energy is mechanical energy. So it means that a body that is moving is uh, bringing uh, some energy. Electrical energy, we know what is. It is uh, what comes in our homes and uh, it's uh, probably in our day-to-day -day use, uh, use is the form of energy that we use more frequently. Chemical energy is the energy given by batteries, for instance, and uh, thermal energy is the energy delivered by heat. So if we, if we heat our houses by using uh, uh, geothermic plants, for instance, we are using thermal energy directly. Chemical energy is the energy that is stored by fossil fuels. Okay, and um, electrical can be considered a subsystem of electromagnetic energy, but usually we consider it separately for the importance of electric energy. But just be aware that electric energy is only a subset. So when we talk about energy production, we are not talking of electric energy production. They, these are two different things. Mm. So in, in the, as we will see, electric energy is only a fraction of uh, the total energy that we use. Um, now, in uh, these categories, uh, we can make transformations. So. Chemical energy can be transformed into electrical energy. This is what a battery does. A battery is using a chemical reaction to give uh, electrical energy to the car or to the phone or whatever. So these conversion processes can be natural or anthropogenic or artificial. It is important to understand these conversions. So let me show you a figure. The figure presents one column for each energy type and one row for each energy type. So the, the blue names are from categories. The green terms are two categories. So from thermal to thermal, you see, of course, uh, nothing. From thermal to chemical, you pass, you convert thermal energy to chemical energy through endothermic reactions. You convert thermal energy into electrical energy 
perhaps through thermoionic emission. You don't need to remember all of these terms. Maybe the categories, yes, the different forms of energy, please make an effort. It may be a question for the quiz. It's not a question for the quiz, the name of these processes or name of these transformation, transformation ways. So from thermal energy, you can obtain electromagnetic energy through the incandescent light bulb. And from thermal energy, you can obtain kinetic energy through engines. From chemical to thermic to thermal, you can pass through uh, through a combustion. And from chemical to electrical through batteries, as I said, and etc. It's uh, interesting to see the role of muscles from chemical to kinetic. So when you when you raise uh, something you are, are giving energy to the something that you are raising and uh, it is obtained by your body through chemical reaction here you see in uh, in uh, uh, in red what we can call natural processes natural transformation uh, transformation that take place through natural systems. So muscles are a natural system. In, uh, in black, you see the transformation that are managed by humans. So batteries, it's a human invention that uses a natural process, which is the chemical reaction, but in an artificial way. It's artificially stimulated. And I, I'm not reading everything. It is just interesting to see uh, that from, uh, uh, from um, the several categories, you can exchange, you make exchanges, you can make exchanges of, of uh, the form of energy. What happens when you make this transformation? Is energy lost? Is part of the energy lost or not? So what happens? Uh, do we lose something when we make these transformations? The answer is not easy because uh, um, there is the first law of thermodynamics, which is actually the energy conservation law. So what does this law say? It says that the total energy of an isolated system remains constant. Here there is a spelling error, it's a system, not systems. Okay, I, I, I need to remember to correct it. So the total energy of an isolated system remains constant. So this is a good news because you may think that energy is conserved, which is true. So what is an isolated system? I think we already learned that the earth system is not isolated, but the universe is. The Earth system is not isolated because it takes energy from the sun. But if we consider the universe, the universe is isolated. And therefore the total energy of the universe is constant. So this is on the one hand a good thing. On the other hand, you realize that there is something that it's not clear here, okay? Let's keep this question mark. I will explain it with the next slide. Energy can only be converted among the six forms. And therefore the expression energy production is formally wrong. It's a form of energy that can be produced. I can produce hydroelect sorry, electric or electrical energy, but it's not energy in the wide sense that is produced. It's just, uh, it, it is constant, cannot be produced, okay? So any process is an energy conversion. Now, I mentioned a question mark because I said, okay, the energy of the universe is constant, but I think that something is not clear here because uh, indeed the energy is, is constant, but any conversion implies a degradation of energy which means that the energy remains the same, but our capability to use it for our purposes decreases. Let me better explain. Energy is conserved after transformation, but any transformation implies a decrease 
of the capability of energy to produce work. And uh, think of, uh, of uh, hydropower, production of hydroelectric energy. We know that we can use, we can derive in form of uh, electric energy from uh, hydropower about 60% of the original energy possessed by water. So we say now, today we, we are more efficient, let's say 75%, but a full energy conversion in terms of energy of water to, uh, to uh, electric energy, it's not possible. So the question may be, where does it go, the remaining part, the remaining 25%, where does it go? It goes to heat. The machinery is heated while producing the electrical energy, and then the seat goes, uh, goes in the hair. And uh, going into the hair, it goes into a body that is cool. And we cannot use this heat back to produce, to transform it in other forms of energy. Uh, in fact, uh, what does the second law of thermodynamics say? Um, deals with energy transformation and the natural tendency to move towards more degraded forms, which cannot use any longer. So second law of thermodynamics. There are many ways to state it. Uh, I made a selection here. One simple statement of the law is that heat always moves from hotter objects to colder objects or downhill. Unless energy in some form is supplied to reverse this process. So when we boil water, we put water, cool water over the fire, we get from the fire, it's our energy supplier to make the water warm. But we cannot take this energy from a cooler body. We need to take the energy from a hotter body. It's not possible to revert this flow. So as we degrade energy, we lose the capability of the energy to make work because for instance, we heat the atmosphere and there is no way from the atmosphere to get back this heat to a warmer body. It becomes uh, cooler and cooler and, and uh, there is no way of getting it back. Fortunately, the earth system is an open system. So we can get heat from the sun to reestablish the equilibrium to put energy back in a form that we can use because the sun makes the atmosphere warmer and warmer and besides heat may provide the energy that we need to warm up to get more heat and uh, so what is the, per the moral of the story? Fortunately, the Earth is an open system, so we can use the energy from the sun to ensure a perpetuity to this cycle, to perpetuate this cycle. We continuously receive energy. On the other hand, the universe is an isolated system. So in the overall universe, the capability of the energy to produce work is decreasing. And this explains why planets die, why Mars died. There was water over Mars, Mars, uh, there is no water today. Because uh, the overall energy, why Mars lost uh, its atmosphere, as I already mentioned to you, because the nucleus became uh, cooler and cooler, and then the magnetic field was interrupted. And this is what will happen progressively to the universe. The universe is going up. When the sun will exhaust its content of energy, its heat, then what will happen is that the energy will be degraded, degraded, and degraded unless another star comes into, into play. 
or some other transformation, some other big bang that brings energy into the universe, then the capability in the universe of energy to produce work will progressively decrease to a state where the entropy will be maximum. You may have heard, and those of you who study physics know that the entropy of the universe tends to a maximum, which means that the total capability of the energy of the universe to produce work will tend to a minimum. But of course, in our time scale, we can benefit from the fact that the Earth system is an open system, biological systems are open systems, and therefore we can continue to receive energy. Our body can continue to receive energy in the form of burning fossil fuels, getting energy from the, from the sun, and then we can continue to produce work. So this is something that is close to philosophy, but actually it has a very clear physical meaning, meaning that energy cannot be produced, the capability of the universe to produce work will tend to a minimum, the Earth system is an open system, can receive energy from the sun in our time scale of interest. Billions of years, probably, or trillions of years, probably, will continue to receive energy. And therefore, our question today is how to manage this energy in the best way, how to produce energy in forms that can be used without impacting the Earth system significantly. Okay. I think the next slide says what I just mentioned. So, um, yeah, I think I have nothing to add. So the conclusion here, the third bullet point is the earth system and biological systems are open systems. Okay, now another interesting classification of energy. This is more technical. This is more practical. Two categories, primary and secondary energy. We will see other classification like non-renewable and renewable. We are progressing towards a more technical discussion regarding energy. Primary and secondary energy. Primary energy consists of unconverted or original fuels. Secondary energy includes resources that have been converted or stored. So primary energy sources. Petroleum, oil, natural gas, coal, biomass, flowing water, wind, solar radiation. This is energy that it's ready to be harvested and uh, to be maybe converted if we need it. Like water, flowing water is energy that can be directly harvested and we can use it to move, uh, for instance, the, the wheels of a mill or to produce electric energy. Secondary energy cannot be harnessed directly from nature. Mm. It, has, it is energy that has been converted, which means some losses, and uh, losses uh, mean a decrease of the ability to produce work. For instance, electricity cannot be directly mined or harvested. Okay, if you think of, of uh, lighting, uh, uh, thunderstorms, uh, you have in this case electricity that is naturally produced, but actually in practice, we cannot harvest easily. It. Uh, and, uh, and therefore we consider electricity um, uh, secondary energy. Uh, Primary energy can be non-renewable or renewable, like flowing water is renewable. Even if we will see, we will discuss it. The definition of renewable is something that is uh, not so, not so, I mean, the classification in these two categories, these two categories are not uh, strictly separated. There is some intersection. We will see the definition of renewable energy. And renewable energy is uh, uh, collected, as you know, I want to anticipate this, from renewable resources that are naturally replenished on a human time scale. So this makes uh, the separation not strict. There is a gray zone because, for instance, if you think of um, biomass, I am anticipating the next slide, biomass, uh, 
not all of it can be produced, can be renewed on a human time scale, which means that you can use uh, biomass to, uh, to um, as a primary energy source, but the time of production of energy from biomass may require more than the human time scale. What is the human time scale? Usually it is the time scale of the duration of our life, which is reduced because conventionally we, we can take it like, okay, now the average is about 80 years, but it's, it's very small with respect to the time scale of natural processes. And the renewable energy is, as you know, sunlight, wind, rain, tides, waves, uh, geothermal heat. Uh, and uh, even if geothermal heat, actually, it's not strictly renewable, but in a human time scale, it's renewable. It's not going to be depleted in, into the time span of the human time scale. Of course, uh, uh, we know that renewable energy stands in contrast to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, uh, in principle, they are renewable, but in a very long time scale, into a geologic time scale, and therefore they are considered not renewable. And uh, moreover, if they were renewable, this would be a problem because uh, they cause uh, CO2 emissions. Of course, uh, if they were renewable, it means that uh, if we could accelerate uh, the process of producing fossil fuels, uh, th this would uh, occur at the expense of uh, CO2 captured from somewhere else because the carbon cycle is, is the, the quantity of carbon is constant. So uh, actually, if they were renewable, probably this would mean that we, uh, we would have more efficient ways of reducing the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Actually, they are not renewable. So let's, let's consider them not renewable and also precisely because they are not renewable, they contribute to uh, imbalance in the distribution of carbon, which is concentrated in the atmosphere rather than in, in the body of the earth. Um, keep in mind that uh, renewable doesn't mean sustainable because for instance, solar energy, it's hard to sustain because uh, uh, it's uh, the development of, of solar energy, the exploitation of solar energy requires covering with solar mirrors, uh, part of the landscape and it's not sustainable. And uh, some of the energy sources are also, renewable energy sources are not, are also not sustainable because they are, the time of uh, renewing them is much long and therefore actually they are not renewable. Biomass is uh, again an example, even in this case. So some examples of primary energy, which can be subclassified into three categories, into three subcategories, crude oil, hard coal, natural gases, nuclear energy, we can put them into a category and then wastes. And then the third category is wind, geothermal, biomass, hydroelectricity, wave and tidal energy. So the last one is basically related to mechanical transformation from mechanical energy, from, uh, sorry, from kinetic energy to electric energy. Geothermal is a transformation from uh, Geothermal heat and biomass is uh, uh, a transformation that is derived through the, the decomposition of the biomass, so it's a chemical reaction. Now, uh, hydroelectricity is uh, meant to indicate energy contained in flowing water, and therefore it is primary. And uh, so keep it in mind because we will need to discuss hydroelectricity with more details because uh, it plays a relevant role which is often not uh, considered enough. So as we will see, hydropower is producing only a small part of the total energy that we produce. But on the other end, we will see that uh, in terms of reliability, it's very reliable. And it also gives a very important opportunity for storing energy. When we store water into a dam, we are storing energy. We can use it when we need it. And this gives to hydropower reliability, to hydroelectricity reliability. On the other end, it has an impact. It's not easily sustainable because, you know, dams, 
a huge environmental impact. Okay, now, this, uh, this is a picture which translates into an image what I just said. So primary energy, uh, crude oil, hard coal, natural gas, waste, wind, geothermal, biomass. And then through transformation, we can get secondary energy like petroleum products. So if you think, for instance, of, um, of uh, the fuel that we use in the car, it is a petroleum product. So it's already transformed. It's not... Uh, we, cons we don't consider it a primary energy. The primary energy is the crude oil. Okay, electricity and heat is a secondary energy. Biofuels, it's a secondary energy, etc. Now, um, unfortunately, energy production is the driver of most of the global emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, and the estimates are here. So. Uh, energy is responsible of about 73% uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, sorry, the title is wrong here, energy classification should be energy uh, and, uh, and uh, CO2 emissions. So energy is responsible for about 73% of um, our emissions of greenhouse gases. And then the direct industrial processes is only 5%. Waste is just 3%. Agriculture, forestry, and land use is another uh, good percentage, is close to 20%. These percentages are indicative, are qualitative. It's not easy to make an estimate, to make an assessment, a quantitative assessment of human emissions. It's not easy. These are just uh, guesses derived through models but we don't have measurements, direct measurements of human emissions. On the other hand, from a, a qualitative point of view, these numbers provide a figure that is reliable and gives to us the impact, the feeling of the impact, a picture of the impact on climate of energy production is very relevant. It's very relevant. And you know why then when we discuss about climate change, we discuss also of energy. We discuss of water, we discuss of natural hazards, and we discuss of energy. It's, and also we discuss of diet. So the last, uh, the fourth item, we discuss diet for this reason, because almost 20% of, uh, of the emissions are related to land use. So it's clear that an efficient climate policy and efficient climate action requires an intervention with priorities on what? On energy production first and food production second. This gives to you the idea of the big picture. This graph is very nice and provides more details, but it just says in a more complicated way and in a more detailed way what I just said. This is uh, get. Uh, this is got from our world in data. This figure is about uh, uh, 2019, so four years old. So maybe that if you go there now, they are slightly changed. But what it says is global greenhouse gas emissions by sector, and this is for the year 2016. Actually, it was published later. So when I downloaded this picture, it was 2019. But you can easily go there and download the updated picture. Mm, uh, as you can see here, energy, 73%. And energy use in industry, it's about 24%. So keep in mind that the direct industrial processes are responsible for just 5% of the emissions. But on the other end, industrial processes use energy and they use energy to the extent of, uh, of uh, being responsible of 24% of the emissions. So 24 plus 5, 29, the industrial, uh, the industrial sector. Transport is using uh, about 16% uh, six, uh, of uh, the uh, energy and uh, sorry, transport is uh, using energy 
therefore determining 16% of the emissions, energy use in buildings 17%, unallocated fuel combustion uh, 7%, and the fugitive emissions from energy production 5% and energy in agriculture and fishing only 1.7%. And then you see industry 5% with the subdivision in cement and chemicals, waste, landfills and wastewater 3% and agriculture, forestry and land use 18% through deforestation, cropland, crop burning, risk cultivation, agricultural uh, soils, livestock and manures with livestock and manures and agricultural soils uh, reaching almost 10%. So it's, it's, um, it's nice. And also in, uh, in the industrial part of it, you see a subdivision in, uh, in, uh, in uh, um, categories. I think it is interesting if you look at transportation, road transport is responsible for 12% of the emissions. Aviation is 2%. So just be aware of this because sometimes the feeling that we get for the contribution to CO2 emissions is biased because you, you know what is the attention that has been given to the sector of, uh, of, uh, of uh, aviation being responsible for significant emissions. Actually, aviation is, is uh, yeah, it's responsible of emission, but it's 2%. It's comparable to chemical industry. It's comparable to risk cultivation. It's, it's less than crop burning and it's comparable to deforestation. So, I mean, I agree that we should review, reduce air traveling. On the other hand, if we use the train, I'm not really sure that this implies more than a nice and positive message. Of course, if we use the train, there is, um, we are delivering a positive message. But the train, by using electricity, is anyway standing in, uh, in, the, in the part of rail, which is 0.4%, is less than aviation. But if we use more the train and less the plane, I'm not really sure the 0.4% of the rail can get to 1%, and maybe the aviation goes to 1.5 at this stage. I mean, I'm not really sure that if we shift completely over train, we get a significant reduction of CO2 emissions. It is a positive message, which is, which is important because there are also emissions related to the production of, of aircrafts. It is, it is important that we send a positive message, but from a technical point of view, I don't think it's aviation the problem. It is of course contributing, but the real problem is energy production, the forms in which we produce energy, and the real problem is also food production. Okay, now, uh, this is uh, about primary energy use, so world marketed energy use by fuel type. And you see the progress from 1990 to uh, today and the prediction to 2035. So nuclear is increasing but it's um, still very low. Renewable are increasing, but are still very low. And uh, the, the unit here is, uh, is a technical unit. So let's look at the graph in a, in a relative manner. And then uh, without entering into the details of the unit. And then natural gas is increasing, but also coal and liquids are coal and, and the liquid fossil fuels are, uh, they keep increasing. The, the, what this picture uh, tells us is that uh, there is uh, an increase, an increasing production of energy. And this production of energy is increasing by increasing also some clean energies, but so far, and also the prediction for the next 10 years or, or, or so, is that also 
the use of fossil fuels will increase. This is something that we know still. Now, this is the world energy balance. Uh, this is a picture that goes back to 2018. So fossil fuels produce 81%. Now it's a bit less, but not much less. Let's say probably it's 79, 80. Coal and oil almost uh, in uh, the in uh, almost around around 30 percent, and the gas, the natural gas, 22 percent. The natural gas is uh, is uh, cleaner, as we know, with respect to oil and coal. It's much cleaner in terms of emissions. On the other end, is a fossil fuel, and and therefore is going up. Um, um, decrease, the availability is going to decrease. Nuclear is 5%. Hydropower is 2.5%. So from this picture, you may say, mm, this is really not very important, but let's discuss it later. Biomass is 5%, wood is 5%. And then we have very tiny contributions by wind, solar, and the geothermal and uh, they are very reduced. So renewable here, it says 14%. Today, they are 19%. This picture, as I said, goes back to, I think it was 2017. Now we are close to 19%. You know, unfortunately, wind turbines and solar panel make about 0.8% of world energy. So it is a contribution that is still very limited and uh, also at the expense of an environmental impact that is very significant. <clears throat> so the question is, what can we increase in terms of renewable energy to increase the percentage from 19, today is 19, to 50%? Because this is uh, the figure that I showed to you before, says that by 2050, there is the prediction that we can go with renewables to, to 50%. Let's see later. What, what are the fields we can work on? So in terms of, of energy production, this is a picture that is, is uh, dated uh, 2020. Half of global energy is produced uh, by China, the United States and the Arab states of the Persian Gulf, half of the global energy. And the Gulf states and Russia export most of their production largely to the European Union. Of course, this is a figure that is before the war in Ukraine and China, where not enough energy is produced to satisfy demand. In particular, you know that the European Union is not independent in terms of energy production. Energy production increases slowly, except for solar and wind energy, which grows more than 20% per year. But on the other hand, the current contribution is still very limited. So 20% more is not that much in global Terms. Renewable energy is emerging as a valuable opportunity to decrease global emissions, of course, but in turn, it entails a significant environmental impact, as I said. For instance, wind farms are responsible for noise and visual pollution. Solar farms occupy a significant fraction of land, and hydropower has an impact on the water cycle and land occupation, besides implying social risks. So we, we have not infinite opportunities. Again, energy production. Energy is processed to make it suitable for consumption by end user. The supply chain between production and final consumption includes many conversions, which means, uh, which means that uh, conversion and trade, trade export, export between countries implies losses of energy or uh, lo not losses of energy, but lo lo losses of the capability of energy to produce work. We know that, for instance, transportation of electricity involves an eating of the wires, which means uh, th that uh, uh, the capability of the, uh, the amount of hydroelectricity is reduced and the capability of the whole bunch of energy to produce work is reduced. Um, let's see some statistics and then we make the break on the global final energy use, which is given by the International Energy Agency information from 2017. Residential, 25% of energy. Transport, 29% of energy. 
industry 29%, other 21%. So residential is important, but it's just 20% of the total. Let's make a break of 15 minutes. Do you have any question? Yeah, there is a question, please. The consumption of? Mm, you mean, uh, uh, the question was, uh, what about the climate energy balance, uh, correct? So the energy balance is, uh, more... You mean this slide? This is uh, uh, the world energy balance, uh, which uh, means that today, uh, Coal, for instance, covers 27%. Uh, and I think it is irrelevant here to say the time window because uh, it's a percentage uh, of the energy production at the current time. Let me see. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I understand. Okay, I understand. So, because uh, you, you see, I didn't notice that. So this is a good uh, question. So the, um, you look at the vertical axis, uh, which is, uh, okay, I would say that this is, uh, I should check, but I would say, let me just see, because it's billion tons of oil equivalent. So 12 billions, it's about, uh, let me see, 14 billions tons, uh, of oil equivalent, I would say that it's a yearly contribution, but I, I should check. I'm not really sure of what I'm saying. I, I, I say yearly because it makes sense. It's uh, the reference is one year, but I should check. And also the order of magnitude of billion of tons of oil equivalent. I think it's, uh, it's okay, but I should check. I will provide a more, uh, uh, a more uh, uncertain answer next time. Okay, other questions? Yeah, there is a question, please. The transportation and diet, but the major source of one of the major sources of CO2 and one of the major energy consumption consumption is about the industry. Yeah, so the question is uh, uh, today there is. Uh, uh, from the political perspective, a lot of attention on diet and transportation. Yes, I, I okay. And uh, but we see from the figure here, just one second, the figure is this one that there is uh, a significant contribution by industry. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, if you look at this graph, you see that transportation accounts for 16%, uh, agriculture, forestry, and land use. Uh, and uh, I would say not really 18 because there is, let's say 15%. So similar to transportation. Industry takes uh, as um, a percentage of 24 plus, it's about uh, twice the emissions. But uh, so I agree that industry is probably more relevant in terms of emissions uh, with respect to the, uh, tra individually transportation and uh, food production. On the other hand, I wouldn't say that uh, the politics is given less priority to industry. Do you think so? I, I'm, uh, I mean. It's about, uh, I, I think it's like that, but it's from my perspective and that because there is uh, a lot of uh, thoughts about uh, uh, what type of transportation, so more, more public transportation or use of less uh, fuel and more uh, electrical cars. At the same mm -hmm. time, there is a lot of concern about uh, um, what diet we should, we should have. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the student is saying that uh, there is indeed uh, by the media, I would say, uh, a major focus on uh, uh, transportation and uh, CO2 emissions related to food production rather than industrial production. I would say that, uh, you know, the media, they deliver a message to the public. And uh, I think uh, the media 
take this attitude. I don't think it's a political choice. Take this attitude because uh, this is the message that is useful to change uh, the habit of people and therefore to provide the awareness for, um, for uh, an individual contribution to climate change mitigation. So I, I think uh, our capability to uh, affect and to have uh, an effect and impact on the industrial system is, uh, is more limited. And uh, because the industrial system, uh, uh, you know, it is also providing uh, essential resources. So you say, okay, also food is essential, but on the other end, uh, I think, uh, I don't see, I think the idea is interesting what you are saying, but I don't think I can't uh, figure out what kind of message the media could deliver to help us to reduce uh, our use of industrial products uh, in a way that mitigates climate change. So what could they say? I think that it is very, very clear what they say about transportation, walk, don't take the car, or about the diet, don't limit your use of meat, which I think it is also interesting because uh, for personal health and also for air pollution, but what could they say in terms of, uh, I think it is a more political question. I think that nowadays the only thing that said is to avoid the buy Yeah, the student is saying that um, indeed uh, the, there might be ways for us to contribute also by, by changing the industrial sector, the, the production of the industrial sector. I think it is interesting what you're saying because uh, uh, it's not, I don't have an immediate answer, but uh, what I can say is that indeed I see there is bias sometimes in the, in the media when they provide information on climate change and uh, mitigation adaptation. I think that indeed there is bias because there are some, uh, um, some recommendations, announcement that uh, increase the share of uh, the media, increase the visibility of the media, and they are biased towards, uh, towards looking for visibility. So maybe that uh, there is indeed uh, also a bias in this type of information. I think that to know the numbers helps in understanding. And I didn't uh, think of what you're saying, but uh, we could uh, look for data also in terms of uh, media, media uh, treatment of the, of the problem, like they make statistics on the visibility exposure of politicians. <laughs> One could make statistics on, on the message that they deliver. You can clearly see a difference between, uh, between the medias. And the difference is also related to political orientation, as we know. So there are some political orientations that are more inclined to give visibility to the climate problem, others that are less inclined. And uh, I think that some political orientation are less inclined precisely for the very reason that there is an impact on the industrial production. So they don't want to, to, uh, to make this impact uh, probably larger. And uh, there might be some bias. This is interesting what you say, yeah. I'm sorry that I can't give you a more info because I didn't think of it. I, I realized the different uh, orientation of the political parties, but I didn't think that, yeah, it is directly related to, to, the, econom to the economy. Hmm. Other questions? Okay, let's take uh, 15 minutes and then we have uh, 35 minutes more to go.
Okay, so first, uh, with regard to the question, I confirm that it's a yearly, yearly use. Okay, and I checked uh, there are several, uh, several uh, data available, open uh, source on the web, and uh, indeed they confirm these numbers. Okay. Now, some more details. This is the progress from uh, uh, 2000 to 2021 of the global energy consumption. So you see that uh, in terms of uh, coal, there is uh, an increase of the use and the stabilization around 2014, 13. You see the bars, each bar indicates one year. This is including 22 years of data, so 22 bars. So the call about from 2011, I would say there is a stabilization. You see that there is a minimum in, uh, in 2020 for uh, the lockdown of the pandemics. And uh, you see a similar uh, progress with oil. And uh, oil, uh, there is... Uh, indeed uh, some difference because the trend is uh, continuously increasing with the exception of uh, the year of the pandemic and also 2021 20, probably for the effect uh, of uh, the lockdowns uh, that uh, we had uh, also in that year. For the natural gas, uh, you see the picture which is uh, increasing and it is sharply increasing for uh, the compensation because uh, efforts have been done in order to reduce uh, the use of fossil fuels, uh, which are more emittive, more uh, influential in emissions. So there has been a priority that has been given on the use of natural gas. In fact, you see that there is a rapid increase of the use of natural gas. On the one hand, I think uh, it has been a wise policy Natural gas is not going to last uh, forever. But on the other end, in order to gain time for uh, the uh, energy transition to become effective, it is a wise idea to use fossil fuels that generate less emissions, therefore giving priority to the, to the natural gas instead that uh, using oil, for instance. On the other end, uh, you know what has been the result in terms of uh, international equilibrium, because uh, shifting towards the use of natural gas uh, uh, has the implications, political implications, which we know quite well, which uh, forced, uh, after the onset of the war in Ukraine, some countries to go back to the use uh, of uh, coal and oil. So. As I said, uh, on, it was a wise idea. On the other end, we understand that there are also international implications, in, in implications for sure in international relationships that have to be carefully considered. Now we are trying to shift our uh, uh, suppliers of natural gas, our, I say, for Italy. But you know that this implies social costs because shifting towards other suppliers means that uh, the price of the natural gas and the price of the energy is increased. And for the nuclear, you see that there is a steady situation, a steady situation with uh, a slight decrease, but very slight in the first 10 years uh, and a moderate increase after uh, 2011, 2012. The hydropower is increasing and uh, the other renewables are sharply increasing, but uh, you see that the plus 16% per year. On the other end, uh, their uh, uh, total contribution to the total energy production is still limited. We may draw some considerations basing on this graph, but let's uh, postpone them to the end of this lecture today. Now, uh, this is uh, again another graph which is providing similar information, and this is quite outdated, is uh, going back to 2010. 
And you see that here the fossil fuels uh, are at uh, 80%. These are different databases. So there is indeed a different timing, but also it's a different database. And um, here you see that the fossil fuels are still 80%. The renewable are at 16, which is compatible with the 19, 20 today. And the nuclear is limited to 2.7%. What is interesting here is the zoom that is made on the renewable. And uh, you see that there is a relevant role played by biomass heat, which is, uh, okay, it's renewable, but on the other end, uh, it's also causing some uh, uh, emissions, some CO2 emissions, because the degradation of the biomass is implying uh, some emissions. And there is the solar hot water, which is a uh, very reduced percentage. The other percentage are really, really tiny with the except of hydropower, which is uh, uh, here is reported at 3%. But um, on the other end, uh, it is compatible with what we said uh, earlier about the incidence on energy production and use by fuel type. Uh, on the other end, uh, we need to draw some additional considerations on hydropower, which uh, I postpone for now, but we will uh, discuss it soon. Okay, and then uh, renewable energy. So um, it's, uh, uh, imp it's an important topic. It's an important topic implying uh, the decisions regarding climate actions. Of course, it will play a key role in decarbonization because after that we have seen the percentages and the seven, more than 70% of the emissions related to energy production. It means that renewable energy will play a key role in, uh, in um, decarbonization, will play a key role in energy transition. Uh, renewable energy is... Uh, is, uh, as we say, provided by sources that can be replenished over a human time scale and therefore does not include fossil fuels. And uh, the sources, we know what are the most used, hydropower, uh, as we said, uh, uh, solar, wind, rain, tides, waves. Uh, and uh, uh, let's, we already discussed some of them are not really fully sustainable. So what is the percentage today? of energy that is produced through new renewables. It's about 20% is covered by renewable. And, uh, but if we look at electricity, now let's shift the focus over electricity is about 30%, which is relevant because electricity is uh, a subset of energy, which by the way, it's extremely important for uh, our day-to-day -day use. Countries, uh, most of them are expanding their use of renewable. And I would say all the countries that have means to do that, means means resources, this comes at a cost. I just would like to emphasize that the cost of energy for the end user was increasing already before the war in Ukraine. We didn't, probably we didn't notice that but actually, it was a matter of concern and when I gave lectures at this course in 2019. I said that a relevant concern was the increase of, uh, of uh, the cost of energy. In 20, I think the first edition of this course was in 2020 and uh, before the war in Ukraine. But one of my first comments was, uh, the cost of electricity is increasing, the cost of energy is increasing because we need the resources to invest in the renewables. So let's be fully aware that shifting to renewables, energy transition has a social cost. It is not only a cost that we can, uh, we can uh, discharge over industries, over it's also a cost that is impacting uh, in transportation, is impacting our bills that we receive for the use in our houses. And this cost uh, should be subdivided in an equitable way. So it's just increasing the bills. Uh, it may imply an increase of inequity. So this is something that is really 
relevant when we talk about energy transition and when we complain about the slow timing, about the slow pace of energy transition, we should remember that it's not only a matter of will of politicians, it's also a matter of social costs. So it's, it's not solvable the problem by changing the attitude of politicians. Of course, we need an effort by, at the international level, we need agreements and we need support to these efforts. But on the other end, let's uh, keep into account that the transition comes at a social cost. Now, um, this is uh, addition to renewable energy capacity. And uh, you see up to 2018, the increase of renewable at the global level. And for 2019 and 2020, you see the subdivision in classes of uh, between wind, solar, hydro, and other. So you see here that uh, in terms of renewable, anyway, wind and solar are, uh, are providing a good contribution, which is also higher than the contribution of uh, hydro electricity. And uh, here again, you see another graph, uh, which is related to the progress from 1980 to, to um, uh, 2015 of the energy uh, production in terms of renewable by different uh, countries. And uh, I don't see here the legend of the graph. I think I forgot to, uh, to cut and paste it from the web pages. So let me just check this because it's more or less here. Yeah, it's the caption. In the caption, there is yellow is China, brown is Russia, blue is Africa, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so here you see uh, the progress in terms of um, energy production by countries, uh, renewable energy production by countries. And you see that the, most of the countries are increasing their uh, uh, production of renewables. I go back to the PowerPoint. Now, renewable electricity. So in terms of renewable electricity, so now we focus on electricity. We see a different picture because here we see that hydropower is uh, providing about 45% of uh, the uh, renewable electricity. Other uh, important contributions are given by nuclear. This is global, okay? Nuclear, uh, wind, solar, biofuels, and other. So this uh, clearly shows that the role of hydropower in the production of electricity is extremely important. And this gives the opportunity for uh, um, a more extended discussion on the role of hydropower. Hydropower is providing a reduced rate of total energy production, about 3%, but when we look at electricity, it becomes almost half of it. Furthermore, which is uh, important, is reliability of hydropower. Hydropower can be stored. You know that energy cannot be stored if not in limited quantities. But large quantities of energy cannot be stored. The only exception is hydropower. With hydropower, you can store it. And therefore, hydropower is useful to compensate for the other sources of energy production, which cannot be controlled, cannot be stored. Like solar power, you cannot store it. You have to get it when it's available but you cannot store it. You may think of batteries. Yes, batteries, but their capacity is very limited. And therefore we can use a battery for the car. We can use a battery for an house. And also the batteries for an house are really huge and costly, but you cannot use batteries at large scale and you cannot really adopt batteries in any house because uh, it, they require a great investment. Their duration is limited. There is still problem. Therefore, 
a good solution is to use the solar energy during the day and hydropower during the night. This is a good solution. So hydropower is very good for compensating the variability of the other energy sources. And uh, there is more that we can say. Hydropower, water can be pumped back in the reservoir. Several hydropower plants have a reservoir at the top. They turbine the water and then they collect water in a downstream reservoir. Because from the downstream reservoir, they can again turbine the water in another downstream reservoir. So hydropower plants, uh, in most of the cases are organized with cascades of reservoirs, which means that if you have an excess of energy from solar, you can use this energy to pump back water into the higher reservoir. And this is an opportunity for using the excess of energy, which we cannot store. So when we have a lot of sun, when we have a lot of wind, we have a lot of energy available. We can use it, but we have excesses. And for sure we have an excess, why? Because if we want to have enough energy by variable sources, we need to size them, to oversize them in order to have a, a safety factor, a margin for safety. So if I need from solar energy, 10 gigawatt of energy to be used, I need to design a solar plant for 15 gigawatt. Because in engineering, usually we use 1.5 as a safety factor, which means that in some days you will get solar energy for 15 gigawatt and you cannot use it because nobody needs it. So you can use it for pumping back water into the higher reservoir. And then when you don't have the sun anymore, because it's cloudy, because uh, it's winter, because it's, uh, it's night, you can use the hydropower to provide your 10 gigawatt that are needed. So this is a very good, a very good feature of hydropower. It is flexible, it can be managed. It can be used to compensate for the deficiency or excess from other sources. And this is something that usually it is done. It is already done. In our hydropower system in Italy, we pump back water, but it's not considered to the extent it deserves. This is a very good solution. Therefore, what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that today, we are giving a lot of attention to wind turbines, to uh, solar farms, less attention to hydropower. What is the reason for that? The reason is very simple, is that hydropower is not an innovation. And we are looking for innovation today. We are looking for innovation and also we are looking for, you know, for propaganda, which is fine. I mean, propaganda doesn't mean that we want to cheat people. It means that uh, we need to get the sensibility, the sensitivity of people. And therefore we insist on the innovation and also we have to motivate uh, people to support hydropower, wind farms. On the other hand, I think that uh, we should give to hydropower the attention that it deserves from a technical point of view. It is an essential component of an energy system. I can tell you, it's an essential component. In Italy, how could we survive without hydropower? It's not possible. It's an essential component. Now, the question is, should we insist on hydropower generation? Because uh, there is the feeling that uh, our opportunities for hydropower are already exhausted. And there is a question related to the environmental impact. Indeed, there is environmental impact. And there is the question related to the limited duration. An hydropower plant doesn't have an infinite duration. A dam, an artificial reservoir, after 100 years, maybe 200 if you are lucky, it's completely filled by sediments, cannot be used anymore. On the other end, also the other sources like wind turbines, wind farms, you know, they have a limited duration. 
Okay, one may say that hydropower, once that the reservoir is full, uh, full of sediments, you cannot recover it, while wind turbines, wind um, and, uh, and uh, wind farms and the solar panels, you can replace them. Okay, you have to displace uh, the exhausted components, but you can replace it. On the other hand, I mean, it's clear that the answer is uh, what is uh, most environmentally impacting what is lasting more? The answer depends from the local context, depends on the local situation, on the local case study. And therefore, the, the answer is simple. It is, we need an integration and we need to give priorities depending on the local situation. In some situation, it may be good to push forward hydropower. In other situation, it may be more appropriate to, uh, to use, uh, to promote other sources of energy. But I think we need, in a way, to, to change our convincement today that hydropower is gone. It, what we could do with hydropower is already done, and it's not convenient to push it more. It is convenient, especially for small plants with a limited environmental impact. And there are also room, there is also room for additional big reservoirs. We have to, in a way, overcome this environmental concern that, uh, and this kind of, uh, of uh, lack of confidence in uh, artificial reservoirs. Artificial reservoirs play the fundamental role for the socioeconomic development of the modern society. Of course, we, had, we made mistakes. So in Italy, after the Vaillant disaster, the hydropower, became very less popular and it's, it's still unpopular today. After the Vaillant disaster, few reservoirs have been built in Italy. On the other hand, I mean, the fact that we made mistakes, we made several mistakes in our recent history. The fact that we made mistakes shouldn't prevent us to consider the opportunities in a proper way. So in my opinion, hydropower, both for small plants, and uh, for uh, large reservoirs is not a closed opportunity. By also considering that for small plants, our efficiency, the efficiency of these small plants is increased a lot. Yes, they have an environmental impact because they subtract water from the river for uh, a reach with a variable length. And also they are impacting on the visual, on the landscape. And, uh, but on the other end, uh, I mean, it is managing the environmental impact, managing our relationship with the environment is our task. And we have to find also solutions for that. Okay, on wind, we have some minutes left. This is uh, wind energy generation by region. So you see the progress uh, you see both the progress in wind generation and you also you see the magnitude of, the, of uh, the energy that we can derive from wind farms. Fine, I will make some consideration at the end about um, wind farms. Here we see a map of wind power density potential where you can understand where are the opportunities. There is an environmental impact also for wind farms, the noise, the visual, the noise, and the use of land, because this is becoming problematic. If you use land for, for producing energy, you cannot use the same land for producing, for agricultural production. In particular, the use of solar power is incompatible. Solar mirrors are incompatible with the use of um, of uh, the land for agricultural production. With wind farms, you may have some compatibility. It's hard, but some compatibility there might be. It's a bit hard because you cannot work very closely to these uh, plants because they have a safety area around that uh, where you cannot enter. Now, in terms of solar energy, this is the global uh, solar irradiation, which allows us to understand what are the opportunities. On the other hand, opportunities must be coupled with resources because we need investments and uh, we need to consider the environmental impact. Uh, but indeed, uh, this gives us a, 
perspective on the global potential. And uh, let me conclude with two considerations. First of all, this we said as an impact on climate, or let me make first a uh, consideration on energy and then I close the circle with climate. When uh, we talk about energy production, don't forget about reliability. So today we are much dependent on energy. So reliability of energy production, including uh, reliability of costs, uh, estimates, it's extremely important. So from this consideration, you understand that we cannot rely only on sources of energy that are highly variable. We need to rely on several resources. Remember, when uh, you have a resource that may become limited, the diversity of the sources from a technical point of view is an action and a solution. So we cannot rely only on hydropower. If you get a drought, it's a problem. We cannot rely only on solar energy. And if you get a very cloudy season, it's a problem. We cannot rely only on wind. It's intermittent. We need to couple all of them. Diversity of sources. It works for energy, it works for water, it works for another solution interconnection if you have uh, supply systems of energy water gas whatever interconnection is another solution <clears throat> so that you can uh, compensate so we need compensation in time and compensation also in space so for instance now italy is looking for connections for uh, importing gas, natural gas from other countries other than Russia, which means, this means, means gas pipes. So interconnection is another solution and keep in mind this essential requirement for reliability. So especially for a policymaker, this is essential. I think the Ukrainian crisis has, <coughs> our crisis with Russia, has shown the importance of reliability and interconnectedness, connections. Connections, sometimes are, people don't really like them because uh, people feel safer in an isolated environment, like uh, the onset of, um, of nationalism and sovereignism, I don't know how to pronounce them, but the attitude of countries to think independently rather than planning <clears throat> as a community, which is a risk in Europe, because we know that there is this risk of countries leaving Europe. On the other end, we have to understand that the connection is providing mutual benefit, reciprocal benefit, is not benefiting only the country that has a lot of resources, that can sell the resources. It's a mutual benefit. Okay, now, uh, energy and climate. Uh, recently, this <coughs> index, uh, CCPI, has been proposed, called the Climate Change Performance Index. And uh, it's uh, a scoring system designed by the German Environmental and Development Organization, German Watch. So it's uh, a scoring system that is, was designed by an organization, it may be subjective, to uh, quantify the effectiveness of countries in climate actions and uh, to uh, enhance transparency then. It combines several indicators and if you are interested, there is the link to the Wikipedia page describing the index on my website. It combines several indicators. And one of the indicators is uh, the percentage of renewable energy production. Uh, so I think it is interesting to show it. Uh, countries were with uh, very low performance, with low performance, medium high. Because I think uh, if you look at this map, it is showing something that you wouldn't expect. 
or maybe that you expected it. If you are informed, you may expect it. On the other hand, uh, uh, I think it is anyway interesting. Of course, it is subjective because in the selection of the indicators, it's subjective. So for instance, Germany is medium and most of Europe is medium. One may say, okay, this was proposed by a European organization and they selected the indicators in order to save Europe, maybe. On the other hand, it's, uh, it's a picture that is, uh, I think it is interesting. And if you want to know more, look at the indicators and uh, get more information. But what I want to stress is that uh, energy production is uh, one essential indicator for computing this index. Okay, I think we are okay for today. Any question? <clears throat> Let me just share the screen while I give you some time to think about it. It was not shared. I don't understand why, or it, I don't, I'm not sure. I ask, uh, ah, no, okay, it was shared. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Mm, let me stop the recording and then.